there you are. Before we start our um, HRTPO agenda, we're going to subscribe those here this morning on behalf of the Neighborhood Partnership. Um, yeah. And we'd like to speak to you in right. a few minutes. Good morning, and I'm going to make this really brief. I, I, uh, you all, the mayors and chairs, had a great deal to do with the formation of the uh, Hampton Roads Partnership. Uh, <clears throat> with uh, the mayors uh, came along the business community to form the partnership, uh, and that's been going on for quite some time. Uh, the partnership initially was funded through the RCP funds, which are the competitive competitiveness funds, uh, and they they really allowed the uh, the partnership to undertake a, a series of of events and opportunities for the community and. Uh, but those funds were eliminated um, several years ago. Um, it, it appears that the partnership's purpose, perhaps, uh, you know, migrated to something that was that was not particularly what the mayors and chairs had envisioned when it was created. And so we have decided, uh, we, along with some uh, Green Hill Associates, who's been doing some studying for the whole community, um, that it is really time for the partnership to be uh, dissolved. Uh, there are some funds available. These RCP funds are available. The, the plan is that a business roundtable composed of the leading uh, CEOs and business uh, persons in this community will come together with a business roundtable uh, and will carry on uh, much of the, of the uh, I guess, the activities and pur purposes, but yet at a level uh, somewhat uh, at a higher level than the partnership has been able to achieve. So why, the reason I'm here today is that all of the mayors and chairs are members of the of board members. Uh, we're having a meeting tomorrow. Uh, technically, we need a quorum at the meeting. Uh, I guess it's symptomatic that we haven't been getting a lot of, a lot of uh, people coming to the meetings, that, that, that again, its purpose has, has, uh, been, um, has been sort of compromised. So what I'm going to ask the mayors and chairs to do today, uh, I've got resignation forms. Uh, we would love for you to come to the meeting tomorrow. Uh, morning at 8.30 at VMAS, but if you can't be there, I've got these resignation forms that I'd like to pass out and ask you to resign as a board member. As you know, proxies don't work for a board vote, and so uh, if you are not coming to the meeting, I would simply appreciate your uh, signing a resignation form, uh, and we'll uh, take it from there. Thanks, Bob. Are you on, I'm going to pass them out right now. To who you uh, back to? Who do you want us to return them to? Uh, actually, if you don't mind, I might just hang around and get you to sign it and just, just take them with me right now. All right, so you're going to work on Yep, you can just take, take it along if you all carry on your business. Thank you. All right, well, let's go ahead, go ahead yes. to our HRTPO agenda. Um, I need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, that brings us to the Commonwealth Transportation Board members' comments and updates. We have Mr. Miller, Mr. Lane, and Mr. Elster this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly this morning about uh, the uh, six-year improvement plan, which was approved by the Commonwealth Transportation Board yesterday. A um, couple things. First of all, uh, about $45 million uh, was added to the region over and above the uh, initial draft that was commented upon during uh, the um, uh, public comment period. Uh, that brings the total to Hampton Roads to approximately $2,738,000 uh, uh, over uh, the, um, the, the next six years, which is by far the largest assessment of any region in the state. And that includes Northern Virginia. It's about 27% of all the construction dollars. Now, a couple comments on that. Um, when I first started uh, here four years ago, I made the comment that transportation funding was the most political, inefficient, bifurcated process I've ever been involved with, and that still remains to be the case. So there's a lot of misinformation that goes around uh, when, when, when things come out. Now, during the public comment period, we had some questions arise about how uh, in the, in the uh, statewide uh, planning for things get allocated and stuff. So we did have a meeting with Mr. Uh, Farmer and some other representatives uh, and went through that in detail. So I'm very comfortable in saying uh, that we have gotten, uh, however you define fair share, all the monies uh, that were in the plans last year, all the monies contemplated by the new legislation, not including the regional monies, but from the state, what we anticipate all is reflective in this, this six-year plan. I think uh, we all came to agreement upon that. Um, so 
Uh, I know the newspaper this morning did an article uh, about uh, the plan where it had fair share. And the plan's about 2,000 uh, 2, pages. But instead of uh, recognizing that uh, we got 2.7 billion, by far the largest share, some reporter had gone through and analyzed and, and counted every line item and determined that Hampton Roads only had 16% of the line items and that Northern Virginia had 25% of the line items. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding that one line item might be a billion dollars. So uh, I, I just want to make sure it's clear to this group uh, that Hampton Roads continues to get a significant amount of dollars. Uh, however you define fair share, whether last year's the base population, We've gotten all that, uh, uh, including these public-private partnerships that are going on. So very comfortable. Uh, that's not to take credit from any of the things we've done. It's just stating a fact. That, that's where we are. We all like to have more, but that, that, that's where we are. So um, uh, the comments were well. Uh, we appreciate all the comments from here, and I think the region is really set up. I want to thank the General Assembly members, for again, for their courageous action. Uh, because this plan is almost, uh, when you throw in the regional monies of here in, in, in Northern Virginia, almost close to $17 billion. It's the most, a 54% increase over the prior plan in total. Uh, and again, we're getting the lion's share of those. I'll also mention that when you throw in local, payments to localities, um, and, uh, and as far as maintenance, we are the largest recipient of maintenance dollars across the state. Um, so, uh, uh, we, we need more, obviously, but I want to make clear um, that uh, we have not, I don't believe, been shortchanged based on when you look at the whole, uh, the whole pot. So that's one comment. The other thing I just want to mention briefly, I know we have the, um, this issue with uh, the downtown Midtown Tunnel Project being in the courts, and the Secretary gave a briefing on that this week, I think, that was somewhat publicized. <clears throat> But again, it gets back to um, this issue of what's being fact and what's not. And, and repeatedly, it keeps coming up that this consortium is getting a guaranteed 13.5% return. In fact, it's column this morning talking about comparing that return to someone getting a statement for their bank statement. Uh, that is just not accurate. There are no guaranteed returns with that job. Um, and if you think that they're risk-free, you can look at the Pocahontas Parkway in Richmond this year uh, that has gone bankrupt. Um, so we can debate whether or not it's a good return, bad return, but to say it's guaranteed and riskless is not accurate. By the way, if you look at how the state has fared with the Pocahontas Parkway, the roads built, we don't hope anybody doesn't succeed, the roads built, still controlled by VDOT, state has no obligations, the driving public's not impacted. So that risk has been borne by the private sector. In this case, it didn't work out. But I want to point out that the state and our traveling public has not been adversely impacted by that. So I um, just want to get those out because we may disagree on where we're headed, but we certainly dis shouldn't disagree on what the facts are so we can make the best decisions uh, that, that, that is possible to be made. So. Um, uh, other actions yesterday, uh, we uh, took some action on some visioning with the North-South Corridor in Northern Virginia, which is a big part of our plan, um, and we may have disagreements as to um, uh, what that means, um, um, but uh, looking down the road and being part of a strategic vision, I know this board's talking about doing that uh, with the regional monies that are coming up, and so I just uh, emphasize how important that is. So. Madam Chair, sure that concludes my comments. I'm sure, uh, Mr. Miller, do you have any, uh, want to say anything to your house? Mr. Lane did a good job of hogging all the information. <laughs> Let me say, just as an aside, there's only, uh, Vince Mastraco is the only guy in Hampton Roads that could come into a room of mayors and chairs throughout the region ask for the resignation and nobody says a thing. <laughs> they sign all the forms and it's done. It's just amazing. Um, the only thing I would say, I, I, would, I would ditto Mr. Lane's remarks, I would tell you, it is frustrating um, when you sort of deal with the, the complexities of communication and, and good information isn't shared back and forth. And I would urge all of us here at the TPO and in the various uh, localities to ensure that Aubrey and I and Hollis and or VDOT and or whoever communicate clearly so that if we have issues, we know we really have issues. We didn't just make them up because we didn't know any better. 
Um, and that, that came out again yesterday in the north-south corridor, which doesn't um, directly affect you here, but it does indirectly affect everybody in the Commonwealth. We had a long debate because we were going to accept a consultant's report. And we had a long debate about what accept meant. And I kept pushing that point and pushing that point and pushing that point because it had a bunch of recommendations. And we took the position as the board that accepting it meant nothing. It meant that the, the consultant's report had been finished, um, that it had been paid for, that they put it on our desk, and we took it. That's what we voted for. In fact, we said in the resolution that we did not endorse any points in the plan or not endorse, you know, either way, except for one where we said it couldn't be told. And I took exception to that, not because, as was reported in the Washington Post, because I didn't think it adequately addressed the toll issue, because it did. I took issue with it because they took one thing out of the report and excluded it and ignored the rest, and I thought that was creeping towards endorsement, and I didn't like it. So it was all totally misreported in the press this morning, but the bottom line is we approved it 15 to 1 with my dissent, which was more on principle than on, on practice. Um, so anyway, that, that's all I would tell you uh, about the board meeting yesterday, and um, I would tell you Aubrey's done a great job leading um, Hollis and I in the region um, to get that funding. No one he gets all the credit. He gets all the credit. <laughs> so I give it all to him. Uh, obviously, everything was correct until what Mr. Miller there. About, no one leaves Mr. Miller in the rest. And that concludes all the comments. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Um, next, uh, I wanted to show you all, when we went to see uh, the governor sign House Bill uh, 2313, uh, the governor gave me a pen. And Dwight promised if I gave it to him that he would give the proper honor. So Dwight has had it framed and we have now have the official real pen the governor did not use to sign the bill, but handed me after the ceremony. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> in the box. So thank we, you. We will me. display it appropriately. All right. Um, that brings us to the Department of Rail and Public Transportation comments and updates. And we have Emily Stock from the RPT here this morning. Yes, thank you. I'm standing in for Ellen Drake this morning. Um, we have our Norfolk train six-month ridership data to, that's um, going to be released tomorrow in uh, partnership with Amtrak, and uh, the numbers look very promising, at least to everybody here for, um, for their help making that a success. Uh, we will be starting procurement soon for our Tier 2 NEPA study from Richmond to Washington for um, high-speed rail, South East High-speed rail, which of course will benefit the um, the Hampton Roads region as, um, as connecting the station to the Newport News and work up to the Northeast Corridor. That's a um, $55 million study that we're doing in partnership with the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, and we're also working with most railroads to um, make improvements to um, trains two and three, Norfolk trains two and three, um, to the rail line um, to make Norfolk trains two and three happen. And um, that is um, partially going to be funded by the um, inner city passenger rail capital and operating fund. Uh, we're working with the city of Newport News to review plans for a new multimodal station there. And uh, we are pleased by the um, approval of the six year improvement program. Um, the approval represents $2.9 billion in investment for rail and public uh, transportation in Virginia, um, and then half a billion dollars. Uh, so thanks to all of our partners for um, making that happen. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right, that brings us to our military liaisons, comments, and updates. Captain Culler, do you have anything you'd like to share with us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning. Uh, just wanted to put out that uh, State of the Station for uh, Naval Station Norfolk, uh, everyone should be getting an invitation. So if you'd like to come, it's going to be uh, mid part of August, and uh, it will be an opportunity for me to provide a brief about Naval Station Norfolk, our mission, what we do. And uh, there will also be a tour. There's, uh, believe it or not, especially in the Norfolk area, there's a lot of folks that have never been on board the installation. So uh, if you have not gotten that invite, please see me afterwards. We'll make sure that you get on the list. And then just a reminder for everyone, uh, the furlough is going to take uh, effect here for our civilian personnel on <coughs> July. So we are working through that process. And uh, we anticipate most of our civilians will be off either Monday or Friday. So uh, we think it will probably have a traffic impact as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We appreciate you um, being here. 
The next thing is item six is the HR HRTPO Legislative Ad Hoc Committee next steps. We need uh, two uh, members to substitute at the June 27th meeting for uh, Mayor Johnson and Mayor Price. And I understand that we have two volunteers, one from each side of the water, uh, Tom Shepard and um, Mayor Krasnoff have agreed to uh, substitute that meeting. So we appreciate their being willing to volunteer. Um, the next is the memoranda of agreement between Franklin, Southampton, and Surrey. Um, Dwight, you, have, you want to talk to us about this? Yes, there have been some developments. There are at your seat and included in your packet some materials of recent development. Uh, we thought this was going to be a pretty simple thing, but it turns out that from state code and federal regulation, we've got a, a couple disconnects here. Uh, you'll see a letter uh, from, the, uh, from the Commonwealth, from an attorney there. Uh, uh, excuse me, from uh, Federal Highway uh, Administration expressing uh, some concern about the comment, uh, about the content of the MOU, MOA between the TPO and now the two localities. There is also documentation in here from the Commonwealth's office, Town Attorney's office, that uh, the taxes, uh, the sales tax and the uh, gas tax that would have been implemented in this region uh, would not be imposed on July 1 uh, on Surrey County nor on Gloucester County. That would leave Franklin and Southampton County with the taxes in place. We would have proceeded with an MOA, and we are proceeding with an MOA between this board and those two rural communities. But again, if you look at the Federal Highway Administration letter, they've expressed some concern about the regulatory side of the house. So I've had one long face-to-face -face meeting with uh, uh, state and federal folks. Ivan's here, and I think Ivan may want to have something to say. Yesterday, from 4.30 till a bit after 5, we had a teleconference. We're still working away on fine-tuning so that, in my words, not anyone else's, we don't get a disconnect between the state code and the federal regulations on planning and programming. Uh, Ms. Rita Busher was on the call with us, and she had made a statement I thought was key. The state is not going to receive the, uh, the special funds, the Hayden Road will not receive dollars until she had indicated August. So I thought if we're still working the fine tuning, what I call technical amendments, let's pull this today and have it come back in July. It should be minor changes. I spoke briefly with Randy this morning. It should be just minor changes, more technical in nature, uh, I assume. But until we get there, I don't know for certain. So, uh, Mr. Rucker, you may want to have something to say about your all's concerns. Yes, no, no, I think the prior way I think you put it very well. Uh, but the regulations, the joint regulations, uh, the, the, the federal highway and federal transit, so uh, working through the, uh, the agreement, uh, the federal transit is working, for, for, for working along with everyone at the table to uh, ensure that, uh, we, that the MOA is uh, both state and federal support. Yeah, I wanted to say this because I think this is important to talk about the technicalities that somebody like Vince Misraka would talk about as opposed to the spirit of the MOA. As I had indicated to the group yesterday, it was my understanding the intent of this interim MOA until we can sort through a whole lot of things over the next year or so, that the rural communities simply want to have a vote when their money from 2013 is on the table and at stake. And I think also, I don't want to speak for any of you folks, but I think the spirit of the MOA, Randy, would be if your old money is not at stake, not on the table, I think the members of the TPO would suggest that, that you all not be voting on those such matters since none of your money would be involved. At least until such time as we decide whether we would extend the boundary uh, and then we would have you all or not have you all or it would be necessary to have you all as a full member of the TPO. So we view this as an interim and again that's the spirit that we're trying to, to, to craft this thing so if their money is involved, they get a vote. If not, then they probably would not have a vote on that particular item. Madam Chair, yes, uh, Carter Borden from Gloucester, and uh, of course I've been trying to keep up with this. Is my understanding now that uh, are you trying to uh, 
for them to impose the tax and we have a vote on, uh, we like it like it is. We're not in the district yep. and, and we don't need to have a say. So you will still be a member of the TPO, yep. which is a strange part for Gloucester. You're within what we call the non, uh, non-attainment area for air quality. You're within the urbanized boundary. So you will be, still be a TPO member and you'll be voting on all, ma- all matters relating to those revenues coming to the TPO because you have access to those. But the, the regional taxes under House Bill 2313 will not be imposed on July 1 to Gloucester nor to uh, I can report that back to my board. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all right, you want to move on to item 8? Uh, yes, I can handle that. Um, what we've done, we've been through several presentations the last at the retreat. Uh, VDOT has been, and Jim uh, Utterbach is here, and he's certainly welcome to, to speak to this, but I think we have made huge progress in going from a very expensive concept uh, that probably would not have gotten traction because it was so bloody expensive. We were talking 8.4 miles, $420 million. Now we're looking at an option that VDOT has vetted pretty thoroughly, uh, at least to get us to the next step, and has said that a six-lane option for the first two segments, uh, which is from Jefferson Avenue, first segment to uh, Port Eustis Boulevard, and then from Port Eustis through the Humble Science Parkway, which is 199 on this side of Williamsburg, is very doable, uh, 260 million, I think, Jim, is the estimate from VDOT for both segments. Uh, I think you all have said clearly you've got the money for segment one. We're still going to need to talk about segment two. I have suggested if they run into a bind on interstate funding, come back and talk to us, and you all, I'm sure, would be amenable to uh, considering at least some sort of a match, if necessary, for, for doing the six lane or one more lane in each direction option. So uh, what we wanted to do today, since the, since the CTB and I think uh, um, Hollis, Arbery, and Chef, I think you all had been staged earlier in the spring to have taken action, uh, but you all, when I spoke to Arbery, have agreed you would certainly wait to see how the discussion went in the retreat and if there would be an action today. So what we've done today is put together a basic resolution endorsing the concepts that, that DDI has put to you all at the retreat with a one more lane in each direction, at least out through segments one and two. And they're saying, uh, Jim, you all can do this thing, each of those sections in two to four years, ribbon cutting. So that has excited a lot of people to think that it can come that quickly. We are going to do that. <laughs> that that's, that's correct. Uh, um, in terms of, uh, you know, we've worked with VDOT and they're working with not only you, but the TPO in Richmond, too, uh, as it uh, goes through, but looking to leverage these monies efficiently. And, and now that you've spoken, we can, we can look at it now. Yeah. That's great. Are there any Jim's new, by the way, Jim's new here. Okay, two to four years, Jim, really? Two to four years. <laughs> we'll leave that on. Let's make it through. We'll make it on my desk. We are, uh, we're going to look at it. I think we've already started. Again, the, the, the big debate has been... Um, whether eight lane or six lane, but if we can move with a six lane and obviously work with our partners in Federal Highway um, to move kind of expeditions, we'll, we'll see what we can do. The, the six lane option six would lane not lane. preclude the eight lane design, which means, That's as you said, Aubrey, I think we won't have to undo anything significantly to eventually, if we find those nine zeros worth of money, to take it all the way to Richmond. Yeah, I think that's where what Chef was mentioning is we could take action on this is what. It, ultimately is, but that doesn't preclude here's what we want done, it get done in the interim. And besides uh, Jim, we've talked with the secretary, and I think everybody's pretty much on board with that, that idea. So this will be under your, under your consent item for approval. We won't do the approval here in the workshop, but it'll be in a moment here, it'll be under your consent item for approval with this resolution. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, this is critical to our region to start trying to I hope I speak for both York, York County, James City County, and the city of Williamsburg about how important this is to us. And I, I want to take this opportunity to thank members of the General Assembly, uh, the Com- uh, Commonwealth Transportation Board, VDOT, the local people that have worked on this, because I think this is something I did not expect to see in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. And if you're talking about two to four years, 
is a major uh, achievement. So thank you. Anybody else? Right. Mr. Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Senator Rohn. Uh, my inquiry may be a little more overarching. Uh, I, I certainly echo what uh, the mayor of Williamsburg um, said, but yesterday I understood that uh, out of the appropriations that would be coming to this region, uh, that potentially uh, there would be a deduct uh, as to any amount that might go to 460 on the on the public side of that and my question is uh, while this is absolutely critical uh, on the lanes on 64 on the other side and it's not just critical to the peninsula uh, it, I think it's actually the gateway to the greater Hampton Roads and I certainly thank everyone from Southside for their cooperation because I think we need to continue to forge a greater relationship between Southampton Roads and the peninsula side uh, so that we can try to fend off the hordes from Northern Virginia. But, but having said that, if in fact we have the uh, fateful coincidence uh, that the Supreme Court on review determines that there is an unconstitutionality uh, on the tolling of the two downtown tunnels, and we have the deduct on the uh, the 460 funds from the public side of it, uh, how much of a pinch is that going to put on the region on doing the I-64 expansions or otherwise? I want to make sure I understand the question is that um, uh, right now 460 is funded. It's, it's done uh, in terms of, uh, in fact, we moved $85 million off onto other projects yesterday. Uh, and that's included in the 2.7 billion. Uh, if for some reason that were uh, tolls were not you know, uh, approved, the Supreme Court upheld the decision, then the monies uh, after certainly any penalties or whatever, and I don't have all that in terms of, but I know that would have to be worked out. But I'm sure the three of us would, would fight hard to say those monies should stay in the region. In other words, if we're not going to use them on those projects, they should stay in the region. Now, the board would have to vote, but I think that's where our position would be. So I don't know. I, I'm not. Uh, I don't know of any deduct for 460 in terms of how it would impact um, the uh, 64 wide. There's 100 million dollars right now from state funds set in there um, for that for that wide in there. Yeah, I mean, it might. You could you could have the conjecture that it would help the force of the help the people wide because if we have some money we have if we've already allocated somewhere else in the region you could make that case now we'd have to go get that money because now it's back in the you know in, in your words not mine the hordes um, might be after some of it too but um, you know that that money would just be sitting there be off those two projects or off one project or whatever it ends up now we get that pot of money what are we going to do with that. So it actually, could, you might make the supposition that if you accelerate or, or not accelerate, but lengthen, expand the 64 watts. But that's that's subject to and lots the, of arm wrestling. And that's one point I should have mentioned about in the plant, the debt associated with that, with that, but all of them is becoming a bigger piece of the state budget as we go forward. Uh, debt service, which comes off the top. Uh, and that needs to be factored in when we look at money's coming to a region because we're paying that debt service. I think in this plan, there's roughly 240 million over the next, roughly 40 million, I guess, 240 million over the next six years in debt service on projects here in that regard. Uh, in that. So, um, but, but Senator, I don't think uh, that the construction of them would limit dollars coming. That's one of the things that we've made sure of, and Mr. Um, Farmer did an analysis of what um, the projection would be not for the regional monies, but for the statewide component. And if you add where we were last year and those monies in this six-year plan, now it includes 460, but with that 460 in it, all those monies are 100% recouped. Now they stay, they're here. So that's why I think we would fight hard um, if one of those projects didn't get done because they've been allocated in this region to use them in this region. Does that Thank answer you. your question, sir? Uh, Molly? Yes, sir. Okay, look, uh, 
I need you to kind of dumb it down a little bit. Uh, we got the senator over here saying we're having a little bit of a reduction that might impact 64. You're saying, I guess, that we're not going to have it. I, I've got to go over here with Clyde and say, is this 64 going to happen in our lifetime? Yes. What, no I think yet. what Aubrey and I were, and Alice were trying to say is there's a certain amount of money we've set aside for 64 wide, and there's a certain amount of money we've set aside for 460, and there's a certain amount of money we set aside for the, for the Midtown Tunnel. If the Midtown Tunnel and 460 blow up, then that's that money that's set aside for them, assuming there's some left after the blow up, which there should be, some, that money's got to go somewhere. So it's not a deduct. It's just two projects gone. Now what do you do with the money that's left from those two projects? And my, my supposition was, what Aubrey said, <coughs> is we would fight hard as, a, as members from here to hold on to that money for use on some other project here. That could be, theoretically, extending the 64 wide. Extending but it, but the, the two, the two segments. Or making it eight, you know, yeah. do, doing something on 64, it could be doing something on something else. It could go to Rona. Mm -hmm. But our job is to make sure it stays here and to use it here. So in theory, if those two things happen or one of those two things happen, there would be more money that we'd be fighting for to keep here on some other project which might be 64 or might be something else. But the, but There's no the, the two segments are not impacted. There's, They're not there's money set Got aside okay. regardless of what happens. Yeah, they're already there. They're already there. Okay. That money, I think it's $100 million. I think I have that right. That's all we're saying. Yeah. I think it's $100 million right. that is set aside. Of course, we'll fight for more, but that $100 million has nothing to do with 460. Right. That, that's, that's, that's there. That's set. That's Super. set. So it would just allow us to be able to carry the project further. Or well, the 64 is a, is a, is a, is, you know, as, as the mayor said, we are, you know, that's a primo project for us up there. It's very, very important. Right. And, uh, that's and why I just want to make sure everybody walks that's away from your understanding 64, we're going to, we're going to continue widening that. So, yeah, yeah great. Regardless of what happens yeah. downtown, whatever, those monies are set aside. And what Dwight is talking about working with us and DDOT, which is in place. Super. Thank you. Thank you. With what the senator brought up, uh, whether it's hypothetical possible, have you, and I, I heard what you said in terms of those two, uh, excuse me, I-64 segments are not going to be impacted. If indeed it blows up, where does the money come from as it relates to what Secretary Sean Kanaka said? The cost of the development board on these. Well, we don't know that. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, depending on how wide. I'm sorry, but depending on how significant, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, if, you know, he, as I said, if, any, if, any money is left, if there's anything left when it blows up. But the hundred million is still set aside. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, million. that's there. Now, now, it's really there after we spend it and widen it. That's when it's really there. Okay, because we all know that theoretically, the plan next year doesn't have to be the plan this year, and the plan the year after that doesn't have to be that one. I mean, theoretically, it's not going to happen, but theoretically, next year we could take everything out, start over. But Except the money's set aside. Yeah. But the money set aside, the hundred million's there for the widening. That's going to go ahead unless something that's outrageously um, unlikely happened. And, and anything that happens on the other side, unless there was some catastrophe where the state came back and said, not only did we lose all the money we were putting in, but we owe more. And when somebody come back and say, you know, where are we going to get the money from? I, I guess, but I don't see that out there. We are by statute to pay debt service, committed projects, our bills, and maintenance before we do anything else. If there are penalties, and that's why we don't know, there are penalties, they rise to the top. They rise from here. Because those are committed obligations, and if Depending on how wide, if anything comes about this, it may come right off the top. So I think what we're saying, we, well, it, we, we can't make a commitment. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's conjecture. It's we don't know what's going to happen with those two projects. The hundred million's in there. It's not going anywhere by our vote, and I, you can take that to mind. I was just going to suggest that we get this on consent and we get this read under construction and because we need it for both sides and right. I look forward to it, you know, it, it getting on getting on the road. I was gonna say the same thing. I mean, it's as important, nearly as important to the south side, right? As it is to the peninsula. Sure. I, mean, I agree. We can't get 
unless we get to the back, like I said the other day, you just get to the back of the line faster if you build another tunnel. I mean, it doesn't help at all. all right. so Thank you. It's important, it's very important. All right. I think there's unanimity, unanimity on that point. All right, well, thank you very much. That brings us to item nine, which is the resolution for the Infrared Crossing HRTP of the Fertile Alternative. Now, this, the purpose of this resolution is there's three purposes. Sorry, right. One is to reaffirm the TPO's position that the third crossing is our preferred alternative. Um, it's also um, it has some language about maintaining the Hampton Bridge Tunnel. We don't want to leave the Hampton Bridge Tunnel uh, to disintegrate. We want to continue to maintain it. And also to study, study only, congestion pricing. And um, since the resolution package, since the packages went out, I've had some comments from members about suggested changes which I thought were helpful in make our intents, the purpose of the resolution uh, more clear. Um, if you guys will turn to page uh, attachment 9B in your agenda packages, which is the resolution, the draft resolution. We have a handout with the modifications to it properly relate to the form. On the second page. Have the there is a handout getting ready to come around that right now. Reality, this will be done the 
the study will actually be done in reality come February 1st, 2014. If you want to know what's going to happen as it relates to congestion polling or congestion uh, pricing, um, you're going to find an answer very quickly. You don't need to spend any money on a study to tell you whether or not it works or doesn't work. So if you wait for February 2014, you're going to get an answer. So again, I, I, I certainly support the concept of where it comes with the third course, saying the hint of a shuttle in terms of maintenance, but I feel a little bit uncomfortable at this time in terms of doing congestion pricing. Uh, again, voting against the whole thing doesn't mean I just want to get with people to make sure I'm not against the first two concerns on this particular resolution. I, I, we're really talking about studying feasibility of congestion pricing on the crossings, and I think, oh. yes, I, I, this is a question for Dwight now, because I, I did try to find out more about this yesterday. And it believes, I believe that we're going to be better off having this study as we move forward in addressing tolls and what impact that would have on tolls on certain projects. So, and Dwight, if I'm saying something incorrect here, please jump in. But I would suggest we move forward with with the changes that have been made to accommodate some people and, and, and see if we can get the study on, which will be a benefit to us uh, down the road. Madam Chair, I, I agree. I mean, it, it, obviously it's a, key, it's a key corridor that affects, uh, you know, the, the, the entire region. So I would also suggest we move forward with the study. Yeah, um, and um, uh, I agree. Um, my understanding, uh, and it was a concern by the Board of Supervisors, was that, you know, you keep doing studies, 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 and it will cost the money. And my understanding is that this study would be done in-house by VDOT. Jim, I had understood that Angel Dean had called, asked for a point of contact, that you all are actually, your environmental uh, planning division people are already initializing uh, in the engagement of this activity to, dis to dis discuss and study. To study. Uh, congestion pricing for, as I understand now, and I haven't talked in depth with Angel, that you all are going to run a series of models that are sensitive to tolls to see what travel demand impacts there may be from uh, congestion pricing and tolling at the two tunnels. Is that correct? Um, I, I'm going to have to check twice. I'm, I haven't <laughs> talked with Angel. A Angel, that's what I've understood from talking to Angel. I'll that follow that they, they have in-house, we have in-house, modeling capability so that's what I understand if it goes you know well beyond that and gets into multiples of millions of dollars of outside work we probably want to have a briefing on that before you get too far down the road and so that these folks can understand uh, what's going on and I understand from committee that there's a meeting on Monday because I've designated the committee as our, our point of contact on that particular study so we'll keep you informed on a month-to-month on -month basis of what's going on, what DDOT is doing, and so forth. Well, even if it's, even if it's not, it stays, obviously, unless it's going to cost a ton of money, but my understanding, essentially, is that, it, that it's not going to be that expensive if it is done, and principally would be, hopefully, done in-house, and therefore it would be the money that's already invested in DDOT. But the, uh, the, the I, this is the first I had heard, not, not this meeting, but when you give us that presentation of what they've done on the congestion pricing as a technique, which possibly could help avoid these billions of dollars in future costs, as, a, as an example, I don't know why. I, I just, it, to me, it would make more sense to just to proceed forward and have some knowledge of how it would apply to our particular area. I, I just see that, it, it, to me, that would just be a logical approach. I'll let me follow up on Tom's comment. Because I think if you think about congestion pricing, I mean, the objective is to, to shift uh, the time that people use the, the infrastructure. And essentially for us, what it does is it, it allows us to buy some time. And time for us is really, really critical here. Um, also, you have to think that congestion pricing or congestion tolling, you can call it whatever you want. Pricing tolling. Um, but it's not like general tolling in that it's time constrained and that users have a choice of when to, to use it and therefore they have a choice of whether to pay the toll or not to pay the toll. 
And for those that, that may not have that choice, and sometimes that's the case, there are ways you may mitigate that. I mean, you might allow carpooling to go free. Uh, you might think about offsets. You might think about subsidies. And there are tons of studies out there that look at this across across this country, across other countries that, that show how these things can be done. Also, uh, to a point Mr. Miller made earlier, uh, a number of studies show that public acceptance of this goes way up when, in fact, any revenues that are generated are, are dedicated or tied to open access construction. So studying this and looking at what this might do for us, I think is critical at this point because it, it, it has I, I don't see any downsides of going this direction. That's a general comment. One of the things I've learned, is I wouldn't take anything off the table. Uh, and I think the fact of the matter is any of these large projects are going to have to have some type of revenue stream uh, other than just the uh, monies coming from the region or the district if you're talking about this significant amount of projects. So it seems to me to understand whether it's good or bad, to understand the impact, it just makes sense from both a change in behavior but also a revenue stream. Senator uh, Madam Chairman, I, I may be new to this, but I'm not new to studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, recognizing what an enlightened group uh, that I've joined this, this morning, it would certainly seem to me that even for the individual members to make an informed decision that the study would empirically produce some information that would help someone drive their decision whether they're for it or whether they're against it rather than just acting intuitively or subjectively and candidly I would uh, I'm a little perplexed about the striking and, and possible implementation after you change the word from endorsed to supports but I do understand some political sensitivities but what we're talking about here is basically changing behavior. That, that's what congested pricing does, is it changes drivers' behavior. So I would hope that we would move forward uh, to undertake the study. Um, I just, uh, I agree with uh, what's been said about supporting the resolution which it's read. Also want to thank Claire Ward. She has uh, walked into places where angels fear to tread. <laughs> really, I mean, she's been on the phone to all of us. You know, everybody here is fairly opinionated about, you know, what, you know, how we should operate. And Molly has tried to bring us all together, and she's done it in a way that hasn't bruised anybody's feelings. So she's, she's offered some real leadership here, and I, I appreciate that. I want to thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, anybody else? Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Ellis W. James. I reside in the city of Norfolk, and I'm a lifelong resident of Norfolk. I want to discuss with you funding. No, 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 not the funding we've just discussed. I thank Aubrey especially, as well as his colleagues, for that excellent job that has accomplished some real movement, finally. I'd like to focus on the light rail. I've been attending the meetings in the city of Norfolk. I'm very proud of the light rail. Our ridership is spectacular, if I could dare use that word. And it's clean, safe, and a real beginning. At the meetings that I'm attending, that HRT is conducting, I'm urging the groups that I participate in to 
both in the goals as well as the needs and the problems to consider seriously the question of funding. I would hate to see an excellent starter line run into a roadblock when we need to go both to the ocean front as well as to the medical complex, ODU, past NIT, VIT, uh, Portsmouth. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, but then to the Naval Air Station. The largest employer, as uh, most of you know, is the, med the military complex in Norfolk. 76,000 approximately jobs. If we don't do the planning smartly and efficiently and we overreach, I'm afraid we may find ourselves having projects, this particular project, the extension of light rail, rejected. I'm concerned about that. I hope that each one of the communities that are most affected, especially Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and those of you on the, hand, on the uh, peninsula side who are hoping one day to see that get to the Amtrak area. Um, but I hope that we will carefully plan and not overreach. If we can get the starter line added to and extended now, then we can add the bells and the whistles if and when the economy recovers and we get back on track with revenues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, the next citizen signed up to speak is Hugh Bassett. My name is Hugh Bassett, <clears throat> and I'm president of the Old Northampton Community Organization. And we're starting to feel like the hole in the donut. We're watching the discussions about uh, the widening of 64 between Williamsburg and Newport News, and we're watching the discussions about what to do about the uh, bridge tunnels, okay? And, and, and we're concerned about the widening and its effect it's going to have on our neighborhood and the rest of the city of Hampton. Um, people keep telling us, don't worry about it, it won't happen in your lifetime or they don't have the money, so don't worry about it. The people who made this map that shows you the proposed plans, they didn't come to work one day and just decide to make that map because they didn't have anything else to do. We've already sacrificed a large number of homes. I remember as a child when 64 came through because it took my grandmother's house. The four uh, alternatives other than the no bill talks about taking between 261 homes and 315. And we think that the city of Hampton has sacrificed enough for 64 as far as losing people's homes, okay? And, and my neighborhood sits right on the freeway. I can look out my living room window and see 64. Our suggestion is if, you, if traffic congestion is just something that you're going to have to get used to living with. It's not going anywhere. And every 16-year-old kid out there wants a car, and it's going to add to it. So we're saying either move closer to work or get up earlier. <laughs> but don't come through and take our homes in order for people to ride through our city. And uh, the result is what we call a, a, a transportation scar, and Major, Mayor Ward calls it a uh, Berlin Wall. The other comment I'd like to make is, let me step into my phone booth for a minute, is that <laughs> by going around talking to people in the city, the overwhelming number of citizens support Mayor Ward. She's our representative. Now, we and her disagree on a whole lot of other things in Hampton. We fight that out in Hampton. But on this issue, as far as the widening of 64 and the effect that it's going to have from Hampton, she speaks for us, OK? So I don't have to come back to this meeting no more, because <laughs> anything you want to know about how the citizens feel, I'm quite sure that uh, Mayor Ward can um, let you know about how we feel about it. So uh, we don't want to widen anymore. Uh, free, we don't want to lose any more homes. They even talking about taking a mass of patient oath. I mean, woo, how far can you go? So like I say, Mayor Ward will continue to speak for us. And uh, other than 
hopefully maybe staying around to give me a free sandwich. I don't have to come back here anymore, and you understand how the citizen have to feel. Thank you. I obviously need a picture of you in that shirt. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have to Uh, item 11, there, um, is, uh, there are submitted public comments um, from Mr. Gurley. It's, it's in your package. Um, and, and then we get to the item 12, which is the approval of the consent items. We need to remove item M. And of course, we have item P as amended. Right? So, yes. can we remove that amended? Or? I, I think you can do as you said. Uh, we're removing 12M and. Uh, the item with the resolution as amended which should stand in for the entire consent package. All right. We can do it all at one time. Um, all in favor? Move for approval. Move for approval. Any motion? Move for approval. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. That brings us to the three month attendance schedule, correspondence of interest, we have minutes for your information. No, we have no older new business added. Anything else, Dwayne? Right, then we are adjourned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>